today is honouring God. So the 1990s were the time when the Spirit of God was moving very powerfully and manifestly around the world, not just in Singapore, but around the world. And many people came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. Uh, and they were brought into the kingdom of God. And as a result of that, the churches grew in numbers, some of them phenomenally. That was, uh, that was the era of, in a sense, revival, the, the late 80s and the, and, the, uh, and the 1990s. Now, many believers were understandably awestruck by what God was doing. God's presence was tangibly felt. We saw the supernatural invading the natural realm. People were set free from demonic bondages and many people were healed from their sicknesses and diseases. It was miraculous. And it is not just uh, uh, people seeing pastors praying or leaders praying, but uh, ordinary people praying for one another and signs and wonders and miraculous things were happening. And many move strongly uh, in the gifts uh, and, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, at that time, the sense was that we were living in a time of the Gospels uh, and, and the book of Acts. So, as you can see, it is something that is quite phenomenal, uh, something that is quite, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, it really gripped the heart of many people. And that sense was translated into deep reverence and honour for God. It was translated into deep reverence and honour for God. Now, during those times, one of the favourite and commonly sung songs was this song uh, uh, by the title of The Highest Place, composed and sung by Bob Fitz. And the lyrics is a, is, is a simple song, simple song with only four lines of lyrics. And the lyrics goes like this. We place you on the highest place, for you are the great high priest. We place you above all else, and we come to you and worship at your feet. Now, this is a fitting song for that season, and the lyrics were theologically meaningful. To honour God is to place Him on the highest place. To honour God is to place Him high above all else. High above everything else. This is authentic worship. It is easy to show reverence and honour to God when the power of God is tangibly felt and experienced. However, the posture of honour in worship ought to be a consistent feature in our Christian life. We do not need to wait for the spectacular to happen to remind us that God is awesome that God is to be worshipped, that God is to be honoured. He must always be honoured because He's God. He must always be honoured simply because He is God. He is the Lord God Almighty. He is the all-wise, all-powerful one. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is like no other. He's a holy God. He is infinite. He is perfect. He is Transcendent, He transcends anyone, everyone and everything else. Nobody can compare to Him. There is none like God. And for that reason, we can say that God is worthy of our praise. So, why is it that honour and reverence for God does not seem to be a conspicuous feature? It doesn't seem to be a visible feature in the normal Christian life. Now you just need to look at uh, 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 you just need to look at how many people are habitually late for Sunday service. Now simple things like this reveal a lot about how much we really honour God. I know people can give various reasons, a lot of reasons. I'm referring to not once in a while people are late, but there are people who are habitually late. The lack of honour and reverence is not a modern problem. We read about it in the Bible. We read about it in the scripture. Malachi 
the last book of the Old Testament deals with the issue of the Israelites dishonouring God in various areas, in their offerings, in their marriage, in their tithing, and in the general aspects of life. There are many reasons why believers, past and present, do not take the issue of honouring God more seriously. Now, I'm going to give you only one reason. One reason that applies to the church in modern times. It has to do with the uneven emphasis of certain theological truths to the exclusion of other important truths. Now, this is my observation. The modern church pulpits and media emphasize a lot about love and grace. Of course, I'm referring to the love and grace of God. Now, this is not a bad thing by itself because you cannot overemphasize this precious biblical truth. It is the beauty of God's love. It is the beauty of God's grace that has brought millions and millions of people into the kingdom of God. How else can a person enter this wonderful kingdom of God if not for the grace and the love of God? So the problem is not the emphasis on grace and, 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 and love. It lies in the fact that other equally important biblical truths are not given the same level of emphasis. It is extremely important that we do not focus exclusively on certain topics or certain teachings in the Bible. This is, this is, uh, I mean, this is something that a lot of Christians tend to gravitate towards. Some people prefer the prophetic. Some people prefer to go deep in the Word of God. Some people prefer this. Some people prefer that. But Paul talks about teaching the whole counsel of the Word of God. Meaning to say that you need to understand various things, many other things that God put in the Word of God. Okay, this is so important if we want to produce mature and balanced believers. Among several problems, knowing and believing only certain biblical truths breeds ignorance regarding how we should be living our Christian life. In the context of our discussion here, while these people emphasize grace and love, they fail to emphasize the most important characteristics of God, and that is the holiness of God. That is the holiness of God. God is holy. Okay, God is holy. Meaning that uh, uh, this is the primary attribute of God that is most, the most talked about, the most emphasized in the entire Bible. Throughout the entire Bible, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Therefore, it is the single most important quality of God that every Christian needs to know. God is holy. What do we mean by that? What do we mean by God is holy? I mean, we, 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 through the years, we have this idea that uh, God is sacred, because therefore He's holy. Not wrong. But God is holy simply means that God is different from humans. God is different from the creatures that He has created, including angels. He's different not only in degrees of wisdom. He's different not only in degrees of power. He's different not only in degrees of beauty, love, uh, and, and all the other amazing attributes that you see in Him and you see in human beings. He is essentially different. Meaning to say that God is different in essence compared to human being. God is perfect and we are not. God is infinite and we are not. God is transcendent, transcending everything and we are not. And therefore in the Bible, in the book of Psalms, you, you hear so often the psalmist praying and praising God and uh, saying that there is none like Him. There is none that can be compared to Him. Because nobody is like the Lord our God. So God is holy. So what does this truth mean for us? It means a whole lot. It means that we have to relate to Him in a certain way as required by God. Let's see 
what God requires of people that worship Him. Leviticus 10, 3. I'm going to read first from the New King James Version. It says here, And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. Okay, now I'm going to read from new, the New American Standard Bible, uh, which is, I think, the most literal translation, uh, that English translation that we have. And it says here, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honoured. You realise that two different words are used. One is glorified, one is honour. Just like you know, honour and glory share the same Hebrew word, kabod, in the Old Testament. Okay, they are translated differently depending on the context, depending on the situation. So the idea is this, because God is holy, because God is holy, He must be honoured. This is how we are relate to relate to God. Because God is holy and therefore He is to be reverenced and therefore He is to be feared and therefore He is to be honoured. Now because of our uneven emphasis on God's grace and love to the exclusion of God's holiness, Christians tend to get too familiar and too casual with God such that the element of honour is somewhat missing. We become too easy and too relaxed in how we relate to God to the extent that we don't take Him seriously. We ignore Him unless we have spare time. We don't pray unless we need His help. We obey selectively. Now, while we can now come to the throne of grace boldly, that's what we often quote, right? We can come before God, we can come before His throne of grace boldly because of what the Lord Jesus had done for us on the cross, all well and good. But it doesn't mean that we can come to the Lord casually and flippantly. We must still relate to God with deep reverence and honour. While we do away with religiosity, we must come before Him with a sense of decorum. Okay, I, and I think that is important. But that is lost in the modern church. Oh, because God is a friend. And we keep talking like that, God is a friend. God loves us so much, He's a friend. We relate to us as a friend. And therefore, we take Him for granted. Do you realize in the Bible, the definition of friend? There's only a few people that are really friends of God. Abraham is one of them because of the price he paid because of, of the way he honoured God, because of his deep reverence and, 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 and that kind of relationship that he had with God is different and God considered him a friend. Not everybody is considered a friend. Are we going to wise up to the idea that while we can be friends of God, we are all slaves of God as well. We are all servants of God. In the New Testament, you read the word servant, 90 over percent of the time, it should be the word slave. Dulos, not the word servant. But it has become, in a sense, politically incorrect to use the word slave nowadays, or rather in the, in the past few decades. And therefore, the word servant has been translated to slaves. So now we come to God by His grace. But God has expectation regarding how we relate to Him as children of God and also as subjects of His kingdom. Honour is still required. Now for the remaining part of the sermon, I will focus on two things. Okay, there are many directions that I can go into. But I choose to focus on two things. And what are these two things? Number one, God demands honour. Number two, God demands the highest honour. Two very simple points. It's a simple sermon. And these are two very simple points. God demands honour and God demands the highest honour. The first point, God demands honour. God is not asking for honour. God is not requesting for honour. God is not saying to us, 
excuse me, I'm God, ho. Uh, please honour me. Now, God is not doing that. He's not asking, He's not requesting. God demands honour. And Christians better understand that. Let us read Leviticus 10.3 again. By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honoured. Before all the people, I will be honoured. Now, this is a statement of demand. It's not a statement of request. It is a statement of demand. God will be honoured in the sight of people because He is holy. Now, let us explore the story behind this statement so that we can understand and appreciate the seriousness of honouring God. Everybody knows Aaron, right? He's the high priest. Aaron is the high priest, the first high priest in the history of Israel. He ministered together with Moses. Moses was the leader. Aaron was the brother. He served as the high priest. Nadab and Abihu, these are two of his sons. He has more than two sons. And these two of them are the focus of this story. They helped Aaron to minister in the tabernacle. In, on this occasion, they put fire and incense on their senses in order to fill the tabernacle with sweet aroma. And then we are told in the story that the brothers offered strange fire. Strange term. The two brothers offered strange fire unto the Lord. Some translations, are depending on which one that you carry, whether it's a NIV, ESV, or any other translation, they all use different terms. Some use the term unauthorized fire. Some use the term profane fire. Now, we do not know exactly what that means. But all that we know and all that we need to know is that Nadab and Abihu did not perform their duty in the way that God has prescribed. They did not perform their duty in the way that God had prescribed. So God was displeased with them and fire came out from the Lord and consumed them. Those were the words in the Bible. Fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them. They fell down dead instantly. Imagine Aaron's shock. And I suppose the other priests were equally shocked. One mistake, no mercy. One mistake and no mercy. Nadab and Abihu were struck instantly dead. And the word of the Lord is, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before the people, I will be honoured. So the issue is this, Nadab and Abihu did not treat the Lord as holy and they did not honour God. That is the seriousness of how God takes the issue of honouring Him. You must understand that God is very particular about how His people worship Him. And so we see that in the book of Exodus, God gave Moses detailed instructions in the construction of the tabernacles and all the items that are to be used in the tabernacle, ranging from the priest's clothing, okay, the colour, the details, all the fine details to the articles of worship. And God also specified in great details how the sacrifices and the offerings are to be carried out. And Moses was supposed to follow this instruction without turning to the right or turning to the left. He got to follow God's instruction very, very carefully. So what does this teach us? It teaches us one fundamental lesson concerning worship. Worship must be done according to God's ways and not our ways. Our ways, no matter how sincere you are, will not be acceptable. Now, we do not know whether Nadab and Abihu were just careless. That morning or that evening, they didn't 
they didn't prepare the fire properly, they didn't offer the fire properly uh, in a specified way, or they were just being casual. Now imagine every day you're doing the same few things. You're going through the same few routine, same routine. And after a little while, you say, ah, oh, I can swim backstroke, okay, without, without really any effort. So they were very casual about what is sacred. Now we don't know which is which, but whichever is the case, God's holiness cannot be taken lightly. By offering strange fire, they acted irreverently and therefore profane worship and therefore degraded worship and therefore degraded the sanctity and the sacredness of God. In doing so, they dishonor God. Okay, by doing that, they dishonor God. And the price of their dishonor was death. The same, the same fire that consumed the burnt offering that we read a couple of verses before, before that. Consume Nadab and Abihu. Aaron and the rest of the priests learned a valuable lesson on that day. You honor God because He's holy. You take the holiness of God very seriously. When you approach God, when you come near to God, you do so with reverence and honour. I'm talking to very intelligent people. I know what some of you are thinking. You say, God, you say, Pastor, this is the Old Testament. God doesn't work like that in the New Testament. The God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament seems to have, seems to, you know, to work quite differently. The God of the Old Testament is harsh and uncompromising. The God of the New Testament is so gracious, so loving, so forgiving. Okay, you make a mistake, you sin even intentionally and all that, you get away with it. Why? Because of the love of God, because of the grace of God. But nothing is further from the truth. You know why? Because God is not a schizophrenic. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's unchanging in His character and in His ways. He is still holy. And therefore, He still demands honour. Consider the case of Ananias and Sapphira. Well, this is the New Testament. The story of Ananias and Sapphira is set at a time of the infancy of the church. Motivated by a rich man by the name of Barnabas, who sold a piece of land and gave that money and gave the money, all the money, to the church. Ananias and Sapphira did exactly the same thing, but with a little or rather with a difference. They kept some of the money and gave the rest to the church but they make it sound like they have given everything. In other words, they lie. Okay, they are bragging, they were bragging. They were boasting. Oh, Barnabas can do it, I also can do it. We also can do it. So they were bragging. Now, there, was not, there is nothing wrong in keeping part of the money because the money belongs to them, the land belongs to them. They sold the land. They can keep part of the money and give the rest to the church. There's no problem with that. But the problem is that, that they deceive the church. They lie to the church. They lie to the apostle. And that is unacceptable. So prompted by the Holy Spirit, Peter confronted Ananias. And this is what we read in Acts chapter 5, verses 3 to 4. And so Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself as part of the proceeds of the land. But it remained unsold. Did it not remain your own? And after it was so, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. Upon hearing these words, Ananias fell down and he died. And three hours later, his wife, Safira also died in the same fashion because she also lied to Peter. And Peter put it this way, you are not only lying to me, you are lying to the Holy Spirit. 
Now, isn't this supposed to be in the New Testament? Why was God so harsh? It's just a lie. After all, the man is generous. How many rich people sold land and gave it to the church? The key to understanding this story is the fear of God. That's what we were told in the story. When Ananias and Sapphira collapsed, and when Ananias collapsed and died, it says in one of the verses, great fear came upon all who heard of it. And subsequently, this same idea of the fear of the Lord was repeated, was mentioned again in Acts 5.11. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. What is the fear of the Lord? Now, one of the meaning of the fear of the Lord is reverence, respect for God, honouring God. And so Ananias and Sapphira had no reverence for God when they lie. They were lying to the apostle. By doing so, they dishonour God. And so like Nadab and Abihu, God dealt with their dis irreverence and their dishonour instantly. It was swift. Now, you can ask, why is it that nowadays people lie through their nose but nothing happened? Okay, there are various reasons for that. Let me just give you a quick one. There's a possibility that this happened at a time of great revival, at a time, of, at a time when the Holy Spirit was moving very powerfully. The holy presence of God was tangibly felt. These were the two incidents. But then, but then, there are other passages in the Bible that tells us that at a certain time, when the glory of God was departing, yet God dealt the same kind of blow to people who dishonoured Him. So, sometimes we don't understand everything. God is sovereign. But these are the lessons for the church that we need to hold God in great esteem and in, in great honour. Now, when the believers and those outside the church heard of this news, the fear of the Lord came upon them and they esteemed the church greatly. They esteemed God greatly. We read this in Acts chapter 5, verses 13 to 14. None of the rest dare join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. Now many of these people in Jerusalem were familiar with Jesus because just merely a couple of months ago, for three years, they've seen Jesus minister in the street of Jerusalem in Galilee. He was a good man, right? Kind, loving, and gracious. But with the Ananias and Sapphira incident, these people were reminded that God was still holy and God demands, demanded honour. And so, honouring God is as much a New Testament concept as it is an Old Testament concept. Now, if you remember what I say in my previous sermon, our relationship with God is essentially characterised by worship. Honour is the heart of worship. Honour is the posture of worship. Honour is the linchpin of our relationship with God. Without honour, there is no relationship with God. No matter what you say, no matter what you think, and no matter what you do. So how do we honour God in practice? I'll be very brief. I'm not going into the details because that, that's not the direction I'm going. So how do we honour God in practice? Many years after the Ananias Sapphira incident, Peter remembered this incident and he wrote this in 1 Peter 1, 14-17. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as He who call you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on Him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear, Conduct yourself with reverence. Conduct yourself with honour throughout the time of exile. Now, this is how we should be honouring God. 
living a holy life and conducting ourselves in the fear of God. So the first point is God demands honour. And the second point is God demands the highest honour. Recall what I said earlier, the song, The Highest Place. The first line reads, we place you on the highest place. And then the third line reads, we place you high above all else. And God demands that we place Him high above all else. In our hearts, no other love must compete. No rival throne must survive. God alone will sit on the throne of our lives. And God alone will take center stage of our lives. No one and nothing must stand in the way. Not even your spouse, not your children, not your parents, not anyone whom you love and respect dearly. Not your career, not your passion, not your desires, nothing. No one and nothing must stand in the way. You prioritize God above everyone and everything else in this way. You give Him the highest honour. That is what it means by giving God the highest honour. God takes the first and the highest priority. Everything in your life revolves around God. He's the centre of your life. Period. Everything else is secondary. Your most cherished things, your most beloved persons are all secondary compared to God. So the question we want to ask ourselves is, is God asking for too much? Is God demanding for too much? Is God's demand overbearing and unreasonable? Well, I don't think so. I don't think so for the simple reason that He is God. I've said that, but I'll say that again. He's God. He's the Almighty God. He's the King of Kings and He's the Lord of Lords. He's the wisest, the most powerful, who is infinite and perfect and He transcends everything in existence. And not only that, although He's high and lofty, He condescended Himself to die on the cross to redeem you and I from sin so that we have the forgiveness of sin so that we escape the condemnation of hell, of eternal fire, so that we will share in the inheritance of Christ and enjoy an eternity of bliss. Isn't God worthy? Isn't God worthy of our highest honour? God is most worthy of our highest honour because there is none like Him, none like Him at all. Jesus is worthy. Now we're going to look at three stories in the Bible. These stories are about three men who honour God in varying degrees, ranging from dishonour to radical honour. And we're going to see also God's response or God's responses to them. Now in, first we look at the story of Eli and his sons. How many of you know the story of Eli and his sons? I actually prefer to pronounce as a Hebrew would pronounce, Eli, Eli and his sons. But you grow up with pronunciation like that, the Western pronunciation. So I think I'll stick to that because it sounds a little bit funny, okay? So we're going to look at the story of Eli and his son. Eli was a presiding priest in Shiloh. Okay, that's before Jerusalem was made the capital city and the temple was built uh, by David. So he was a presiding priest in Shiloh. He had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas who also served as priests together with their father. Interestingly, the Bible described these two men as worthless men. I mean, very interesting, right? Describe them as worthless men. And then a few verses down, it has this interesting command that they did not know the Lord. I mean, what an irony. You're serving as priests and you don't know God. They serve as priests but they did not, love, uh, did not know God. 
Now, what does worthless mean? It simply means dishonour. Remember the meaning of honour. It is to value, to consider as worthy, weighty. Okay? So worthless, without worth. They are dishonourable men. Hophni and Phineas were worthless or dishonourable because they had treated their service as priests and the offerings that people brought into the place of worship with contempt. They treated these things with contempt. What did they do? They slept with a woman working at the entrance of the tabernacle. And then when people, the worshipper, brought in offerings, they will go around and send their servant, pick the choicest, choicest meat and take it for themselves. When the people resisted, they would be harsh with these people. So that's what they did. They had totally no regard for God and His holiness. And despite their bizarre and irreverent behaviour, Eli did not remove them from their priestly duties. He ignored their irreverence and corruption. He ignored their immorality. Now one day, God sent a prophet to Eli. And this is what God said through the man of God. 1 Samuel 2, 29. Why then do you scorn my sacrifice and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling and honour your sons above me? And honour your sons above me by fattening themselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people Israel. God made two indictments on Eli. The first indictment is that he scorned on the worship. Although you say, Pastor, if you read the passage, you say, Pastor, it was the son's fault, it wasn't his fault. But you see, Eli was a priest in charge. He was ultimately responsible. Besides, he also benefited from these stolen meats. Okay? The Bible tells us that he's a fat man. Okay? And that's how he died, actually fell and, and broke his neck. Fat man. The second indictment is Eli honoured his sons above God. He cared for the well-being of his sons more than the glory and honour of the Lord. If you honour anybody above God, it is as good as saying that you are dishonouring God and that is unacceptable. So God pronounced judgment on Eli and his sons. It's a judgment of death and it happened not instantly but fairly quickly. Not only that, God pronounced judgment on his descendants. The priesthood was taken away from his house. The priesthood was taken away from his descendants. And the descendants will live in shame and embarrassment. I mean, dishonor, the punishment for dishonor has far reaching consequences. And then, in the middle of the pronouncement of judgment, God stated an important principle of judgment. So we look at 1 Samuel 2 30. Those who honor me, I will honor, but those who despise me will be disdained will be considered worthless, will be rejected, will be disgraced. So these are serious repercussions for dishonouring God. So that's the story of Eli and the son. Next we look at the story of Moses and his wife, Zipporah. Sounds like the brand of a cola, you know, some kind of soft, fizzy drinks. Zipporah. Now it is a curious and obscure story Hardly anybody talk about this story. In fact, the story has puzzled many scholars and commentators. God had met Moses at the burning bush and he has called Moses on a mission to be the deliverer of Israel, to deliver them from slavery in Egypt. Moses, his wife Zipporah and his children, two sons, were on their way, travelling on the way to Egypt when this particular incident, this story happens. And we read of the account in Exodus chapter 4, verses 24 to 26. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah took a fling and cut off her son's foreskin. Can you see 
her son's foreskin, one son. Moses had two sons, but only here, Zipporah only cut off the foreskin of one son and then touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So God let Moses alone. It was then that Zipporah said, Yaks, a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Uh, you notice that yaks is not there. I put it there not just for effects, so that you understand that when Zipporah say a bridegroom of blood, it wasn't, some, it wasn't something complimentary. It's like yaks, so bloody. This thing is so bloody cruel. Uh, that's the meaning of, of, of that. Okay? Uh, some of you may disagree with me, but I don't think you, disagree, you, you can disagree with me after I give you my explanation. So God attempted to kill Moses until Zipporah intervened. This is very strange because only two days before, God had called Moses for a, a mission, for a big mission. And then now, he wanted to kill Moses. Why? The reason, as we can see from this short account, has to do with circumcision. Now, circumcision is cutting off the foreskin. Circumcision is a sign of covenant for the Israelites. God required Abraham and all his male descendants to be circumcised. Now, I'm going to give you, with that preface, preface I'm going to give you the best explanation that I have come across. I've been puzzled for many, many years until recently. So this is the best explanation for this passage. You see, as Moses and Zipporah were, pre were preparing to go on this journey to travel to Egypt, they were le living in the desert of Midian, right? And so they prepared themselves. And during this one-day prep one preparation, Moses told Zipporah, I met God at the burning bush. And amongst many things, he gave me an instruction. Remember the covenant of Abraham. Circumcise your two sons. So Moses proceeded to do that as Moses cut the foreskin of his first son. Blood squirted out and the young boy let out a terrifying scream because it was painful. And then Zipporah was like totally rattled and say, what is happening? Why is my husband so cruel? Cruel. What is this thing all about? What is the kind of God that you're worshipping? So Zipporah's maternal instinct took over. She objected and prevented Moses from circumcising the second son. And so a quarrel broke out between the husband and wife. It wasn't very pleasant, right? Moses tried his best. Moses was caught in between, right? Between obeying God's command and, 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 and going along with his wife's objection. So they, they quarreled and then there was the war of silence and then perhaps Zipporah threatened not to go on the journey with Moses. So Moses was really torn between God's, obeying God's command and his wife's stubborn objection. Finally, to keep peace, Moses relented. Those of you who are married long enough, you understand what I'm saying, right? To keep peace, one party, usually the husband, relented, just keep quiet. Okay lah. Okay lah. You think you're right. Okay. So just kept very quiet. So, then after this, they set out on a journey because the space is only two days. They set out on a journey. Only the older son was circumcised. But not the younger son. So along the way, along the way, the Lord appeared. We don't know how He appeared. He appeared and He tried to kill Moses. Why? Because He was displeased with Moses for not circumcising both His sons. Only half obedience. So God was displeased. So Zipporah, wise up at that moment, understood what had happened. She knew that God was serious about the covenant of circumcision. All right? That, that, that Old Testament covenant, the sign of, a covenantal sign of circumcision. So she quickly grabbed a fling, a fling, fling knife 
and cut off the foreskin of her second son. And she threw it on the feet of Moses, threw the piece of meat on the, oh, sorry, the piece of flesh on the, on the, on the, foot of, on the feet of Moses. And God relented. God left him alone. That's what the Bible says. God left him alone. What is the lesson here? The Lord was displeased because Moses chose to honour his wife above God. The Lord was displeased because Moses chose to honour his wife above God. Do you realise that God did not try to kill Zipporah? She was the one who objected to the circumcision. But God did not try to kill her. Instead, God tried to kill Moses. Do you know why? Because the command was given to Moses and Moses was the head of his household. And therefore, he was responsible. God held him accountable. Now, the lesson here is do not compromise the word of God and truth to please and placate those under your authority. Whether you are a pastor, you are a leader, you are a boss, you are a father, do not compromise the word of God and truth to please and placate those under your authority. Leaders fall into these traps, this trap easily. Instead of obeying God's commands, they give in to the people for fear of problems and to keep peace. The pressure not to rock the boat and maintain peace is great. However, let me say this. If you fear people, if you fear having problems with people, you may run into bigger problems with God. Many pastors and leaders dare not speak out against LGBT activism and many other controversial issues that are cropping up in the recent years because doing so does not sit well with some members of the church especially the younger ones and the more educated ones. But not to speak is a compromise. It's compromising God's truth. Not to speak is to compromise our Christian integrity. Do not be a peacekeeper for peacekeeping's sake. Obedience to God's words and will is more important than keeping the peace. And by the way, such kind of peace is no peace at all. It is false peace. It is not real true peace. It is a false peace. The words of Jesus are instructive. Let's read Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 39. Do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. This is Jesus speaking. For I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemy, enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves sons and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake, will find it. Now, this is one of those hard truths in the Bible. A lot of people look at it and say, I don't understand. What is Jesus saying? He's contradicting himself. But we always have to take any passage, any verse in context, in its biblical context. So essentially what Jesus is saying here is that following him and obeying his words without compromise, may put you at loggerheads with your loved ones. It may even, it will strain your relationship. It may strain your relationship. It will. It may, it may cause a split in your relationship with them. Now, this is the price of standing for Christ and obeying His words and standing for the truth. This is the cross that we must carry. We must not compromise and back down from our steadfast commitment to the Lord and to his words. So remember, 
Do not honour anyone above God, not even your spouse. Do not honour anyone above God, not even your spouse, not your children, not those that you love dearly and those that you respect. That is the mistake of Eli and that is the mistake, also the mistake of Moses. God is not pleased with this man. Do not make the same mistake as them. Now this brings us to our last story, the story of Abraham and his son Isaac. Finally, we have a story of a man who honoured God above his most cherished and most beloved. It is a heart-wrenching story, but thankfully it ends beautifully. Most of us are familiar with the story, so I'll be very brief with this story. The story opens with these words. God tested Abraham. God tested Abraham. How? How does God test? How did God test Abraham? God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son as a burnt offering. That's one of those sacrifices, as a burnt offering. God told Abraham to sacrifice his son as a burnt offering to him. And as we all know, Isaac is the promised son. Why is God doing this? Abraham doesn't, doesn't know. Abraham, Abraham didn't know. Abraham didn't understand. He was confused. He was struggling in his heart. However, Abraham obeyed without hesitation. His obedience is remarkable. I think the most remarkable form of obedience, a radical obedience that man can ever give to God. He prepared the necessary stuff and set out on the journey to Mount Moriah the following morning. He did a clever thing he didn't tell his wife. Sorry, a lot of things you've got to tell your wife. But I cannot say that he learned from Moses because Abraham was before Moses. <laughs> so he didn't tell his wife because that would complicate matters. At Moriah, he built the altar. He put a pile of wood on the altar. He put his son Isaac on the pile of wood and prepared to sacrifice his son. Now, what will his wife think? What will my son think? Scholars tell us that the son at that time is probably a teenager. Not a little boy anymore, you know. That you can, you can bluff and you can lie to and say, no lie, you know, we are playing a game. Unless Isaac is stupid, which I think he's not. All these thoughts were going through his mind. What will my son think of me? What will my wife think of me? But despite the painful thoughts and struggle, he obeyed. He obeyed God. His obedience to God was unwavering. And as Abraham was about to plunge his knife into his son Isaac, the angel of the Lord intervened and said these words to him. For now I know that you fear. That's Genesis twenty-two twelve. For now I know that you fear God seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. For now I know that you fear God. What is the meaning of fear? We talked about that earlier. Fear is reverence. Fear is deep respect. Fear is honour. So in this case, fearing God means honouring God, revering God. Abraham's radical obedience shows that he honoured God more than his sons. Can we put it up? Abraham's radical obedience shows that he honoured God above his beloved son. What Abraham did was extraordinary. And that's why God was so pleased with him. God was so pleased with Abraham. Now let's take a step back and consider the beginning part of the story where he says that God tested Abraham. Have you asked yourself why? Why? Why did God test Abraham? Abraham may not know. But with the benefit of hindsight, this is what I think. Because God wanted a man that he can use. Because God wanted a man that he can trust. 
Such a man must have his heart in the right place. And honour is the litmus test. Such a man must have his heart in the right place. And honour is the litmus test. Will Abraham honour God? To what extent will Abraham honour God? Will Abraham honour God above his sons? Now, no matter how you look at it, this test is a very stringent one. We are talking about Abraham having to kill his own sons with his own hands. And there is more. This was the son that God had promised to Abraham. Abraham's hope of multitudes of descendants and nationhood rested on this one son, Isaac. All his hopes, all his dreams were vested on Isaac. And therefore, Isaac's, dream, Isaac's death will mean the death of his dreams, will mean the death of his hopes. But Abraham chose to honour God. Abraham chose to honour God above his sons. Abraham chose to honour God above his dreams and his hopes. He passed the test with flying colours. God could use such a man. God could trust such a man. And therefore, God declared, Genesis 22, 15 to 18, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as a sand that is on the seashore. And the offspring shall possess the gate of the, his enemies. And in the offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Because you have obeyed my voice. Now let me conclude today's sermon by calling all of us sitting here and those of you who are listening online, Let us honour God. Let us honour God above everyone and everything that we hold dear. Imitate Abraham in how he honoured God with his radical obedience. Honour God not just with our lips, but honour Him also in our hearts and with our lives. Live and serve God according to His ways. Obey His voice. Obey His words. This is how we honour God. And finally, recognise that God is holy and therefore, He must be regarded accordingly with honour, with the highest honour. 